How are we all doing? All excited? Good. Well, I am Luke Mangan, and hi, and welcome to the Inspired Series. Um, today really is all about you guys. Um, you know, hopefully, you are our next generation of our industry. And uh, I've been lucky enough to be in the business for about 30 years, and I still absolutely love it. Um, I'm not going to lie, it can be a tough gig. The hours can be long, the money sometimes ain't great, but what I can tell you is an ex it's an extremely rewarding career. And the purpose of today is to highlight the incredible opportunities this industry has to offer. Today we're very lucky to have three amazing culinary leaders join us to talk about their experiences. And let me tell you, they didn't all have easy journeys. So it's a real pr privilege to hear from them and get their insights and advice on how to build a successful career in today's fast food, fast moving food industry and hear their ups and downs. So let's get on with it. Please sit back, enjoy and prepare to be inspired. Now I'm not one to read off bios of other people. So the Inspired series is all about getting inside someone's mind on how they started, why they started, and how they stuck it out in a tough industry. Because everyone does go through ups and downs in any industry. But what we're going to learn from our first person, Josh Nyland, who's a very young chef and is really taking the food world by storm. So give Josh a welcome and uh, we'll hear his story. Welcome. G'day. How you doing? Very good, thank you. Enjoying Margaret River? I love it. Had a great meal at Long Chim last night. Great. So, Josh, you're still young. You're how old? You well, I've, I'm as old as you've been cooking, so. <laughs> <laughs> no, I just turned 31. Hey, so. Thanks for making yeah. me feel old. Yeah, good. Um, <laughs> good start. So, um, tell us about your early years of training. Yep. How and why you got into cooking. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I always find that cooking a meal for somebody is the most generous act you can do for another human being. I find that was the reason why I, I wanted to be a chef, because I cook mum and dad meals at home with, with my sister, and I'd throw some extra groceries into the trolley and just want to see what they thought of what I cooked. And I decided to take an apprenticeship when I was 15, just about to turn 16. So I left school in year 10. Um, and, and very supported by mum and dad, so it wasn't as if I was, you know, uh, the bad boy that needed to get out of school and go, go get a job. But I, I worked in a local restaurant, which I felt was the, the best decision I could have made at the time, because that business basically cared a lot about my education, and they showed me how to make bread, how to make a mayonnaise properly, how to make pasta, and I feel like some of those basic fundamentals of cooking you know, especially in a world right now where there's a lot of wonderful restaurants to choose from as, as the first restaurant to go into, to, to make a decision that's concentrating on the basics was, was a great one for me because then I ended up working for you a year later. So, um, and I mean, I was 17 when I said to mum and dad, all right, I'm moving to Sydney. Um, so I decided to pack up from where I was in, in Maitland, which was two and a half hours north uh, of Sydney, so made, made the trip to, to the Big Smoke by myself and had my own apartment and did my own washing and all of those things but, but for the why, very first time. Why did time. you want to do that? What, what got you to that I, point? It felt like there was a, a lid on Newcastle where I was um, working at this restaurant and there was, f I wouldn't say there was few opportunities, but definitely as a young chef with aspirations of um, seeing what was happening in Sydney and seeing through magazines and food media and all those sorts of things, um, you can tell that there's a greater level of action going on. And I was very determined to hopefully be the best or try to get close to whatever that was. Um, but I, there was a desire to push myself a little bit harder than, than what I was getting pushed. And also to work with ingredients that were of higher quality and, and be around a more professional environment that would, um, you know, give you that. So, so, so you, you worked with us at Glass and, yeah. and that was obviously a very busy kitchen. It was a beast. Many chefs. Yeah. <laughs> things like that. Um, 
you went after after glass you went to well what, what's interesting and i feel like we should talk about it and i never do talk about it but like i was eight months into working with luke at glass and i was on larder um the cold larder section uh and and popping oysters on the crustacean counter and you know meeting people like richard branson and gordon ramsay and they were frequent guests and it was just one of those experiences that was amazing but you know it, like luke said it's kind of a big business it was 240 seat restaurant and you know it became like exhausting and the intimacy of learning that you know I had in a small restaurant in Newcastle, and then it had gotten big. Um, I start like you start getting doubts about okay, do do you want to be here as part of this big package, or do you want to go find something a little bit more um, small? So I went and I had a look at Balzac for the day, and I went out with Matt Kemp, and I had a look because at the time they were doing this British kind of. Uh, two hat gastronomy like it was nose to tail it was fascinating and I went out there just to have a look to see how, how the kitchen worked and then I get back to glass the next day and then Luke and Joe sit me down and meanwhile they're best friends with Matt Kemp <laughs> who um who had offered me a job and then not knowing that the world is so small and everybody knows everybody and then I looked, you know, red-faced, trying to, trying to tell them that, no, 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 I'm not leaving. <laughs> um, but I feel like that, that's, those sorts of stories happen along the way. Um, but it was, uh, it was only through having an honest conversation then with Luke and Joe, uh, Joe Pavlovich, who was Luke's head chef at the time, um, that we made progress. And I went on to a vegetable section after that and... You know, I learned so much from glass and I, I became more efficient and I became more confident. And yeah, I think that was a, a part to the story that I don't really ever talk about. But yeah, just because partly, yeah. well, because partly it's embarrassing. You know, you don't want to be, <laughs> you don't want to look like you're doing the wrong thing. Well, but I think um, it's a good point. I mean, for young kids coming up, you, it's good to be open and honest because I yeah. think the more your boss uh, or leader you can talk to them and, and perhaps help you find another path, another direction, and, and that's well, what and you did. Yeah, that's right, and that's yeah, and you encouraged that, so that was that was wonderful. And then after that, I went and worked for Peter Doyle at Est, one of the best chefs in the country. Yeah, and still, yeah, just a wonderful educator. Like the 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 level of um, care that went into the actual training was immense, and it's amazing to find somebody of that kind of echelon like Peter to have three hats and also have the time to educate you know a group of young people in his kitchen at the time that were all probably sub 28 years old and so that was where I kind of got this affinity for fish I feel like just this there was a fish section at S that was always just this little beacon of I want to get on there like <laughs> just so it wasn't the 25 dozen oysters you shuck no, twice a day no <laughs> definitely <right>. not <laughs> um <laughs> Yeah, but getting getting to look at a, a proper fish section in a you know in a big restaurant like Est was was pretty amazing. But again, it was one of those kitchens that I suppose lacked the intimacy of learning that I was kind of in my head I wanted. And then eventually found myself at Fish Face uh, working for Stephen Hodges. I bet you got some stories there, but we won't talk. We won't. No, it's <laughs> G-rated today. So. <laughs> Yeah, no. That would, that would have been a good experience because he was incredibly passionate about fish. Yeah, and things I like mean, that. yeah, we laugh about Stephen, and he's an extremely passionate man and a very challenging one to work with, <laughs> to say the very least. But he gave me the basic nuts and bolts of what a fish is, how to handle it, how to store it, how to cook it, all of those things. And I feel over the course of, I think, three years in total that I worked for Stephen, if I didn't have the nuts and bolts that he gave me, and if he. It, you know, then I wouldn't be able to express myself the way I do today because he gave me the basics of, of fish cooking. And where to after him? Uh, so after, after Fish Face, I got married and my wife and I, and Luke came back into the story then as well. He uh, arranged a stage for my wife at the Waterside Inn uh, in, in the UK. So I, I so three was, star Michelin, yeah, one of the best restaurants in the world. That's right. And so I, I'd organised myself a, a trip to the Fat Duck uh, to work with Heston in the lab, and that took twelve months for them to get back to me and say that I got <laughs> I got this position in in their kitchen. So I thought Julie had no hope. So I said, 
Luke, can you organise that? And so the two of us went on a working honeymoon, um, which is a thing. Um, and um, <laughs> we, uh, we, we spent four months in, in Bray, uh, which was wonderful. Um, and eventually Julie ended up working at the Fat Duck as well. But after that, after we, we had travelled and seen what we saw, um, we'd started building a bit of a plan as to how, what we wanted personally uh, in a restaurant. And so all those thoughts we kind of conjured up and we, we opened St. Peter years later in 2016. Um, but before that, yeah. I mean, do you think it's important for a young chef mm. just out of their apprenticeship, do you think it's important for them to travel overseas? Or, or do you think you know Australia has enough to offer? Or no, I definitely think we're extremely fortunate here in Australia with the with the type of learning and education that we have here, and people, you know, like Luke, like Peter Doyle, like you know Stephen Hodges. There's extremely good mentors out there, and I feel like you shouldn't like this is for me personally. Start start at the level like that isn't biting off too much, mm. so that you give yourself an opportunity to step into it. I think if you if you enter into somewhere running. Um, it, it can sometimes get a little bit big on you, so it's not to say don't don't have big ambitions and things, but just um, try to take on uh, the basics first and then build upon it. Um, but I do feel going overseas is an important part of the of the journey um, because you really do learn a certain level of professionalism and you, you see different ingredients and you realise that there's a lot more going on outside of Australia. So it gives you some perspective. Um, yeah, it's, it's always good just to keep consuming food as well. Like, yeah. I mean, as a chef, you know, you're always producing food, but you need to love eating food as well. And a lot of the best learning that I've ever had has come in the form of eating a meal. Going to a, a good restaurant. Good restaurant. Meeting the chef, understanding the Yeah, product. and observing the way wait staff move around the room and, and what choices of words they decide to use and the wine pairings and all that. So throughout that whole journey, yeah. w was it um, your ambition to open your first restaurant, your own restaurant? Yeah. Always? Uh, always wanted to open your restaurant? Always needed a restaurant, always needed a cookbook, always needed eventually maybe one day to have a TV show. There was all those things written down. Um, I write down everything that I want in my phone and before that was in lots of notebooks and things. So I keep a list of things that I want to achieve and tick them off. So you were 27 when you opened St Peter? Yes. Um, were you ready? Uh, were, no, were, um, I mean, <laughs> no, it's like saying, were we ready for our first child? No, <laughs> but you do it. Um, no, I, I went to my solicitor's office the morning that I signed the lease and she was kind of, oh, do you have a pen? And I said, no, sorry. And then she's like, okay, I'll just go get one. She went out of her office and I was looking at this, you know, clipboard full of papers and I threw up in her bin. And then... <laughs> And then she came back and I was all white and then she's like, you okay? And I said, yeah, yeah, and then I just signed. <laughs> and I ran out of there and then I had to sit in my car for half an hour, just floating, just wondering what I'd just done. Um, but then, you know, from there it was head down, bum up and go into that mode of being a first or second year apprentice back at class and, and just you do your tasks and you're just ticking off a very, very long list. And so I think if you were to think about everything all in one moment, then you would never do it. It's kind of that incremental. And I, I feel very privileged as well that I've got my wife, Julie, who's an incredible um, woman who's just, you know, the restaurant nor the book would have ever been done uh, if it wasn't for her. So um, she's a bit of an unsung hero, but she used to be a chef as well. So to have a woman that kind of understands the profession um, and people around you that support you, you you'll you realise your goals very quickly. Did you ever, from starting cooking yeah. to where you are now, mm. ever want to throw in the towel? Yeah, there was a what, couple of what times. What stopped you? Um, well, I think it was more Julie, <laughs> uh, honestly, because I, I was put into a position at the Four Seasons Hotel in the city. Again, another story I don't really talk about, but uh, I was 24 and I got given a... a head chef job at 24 to run a restaurant that was 180 seats and had a bar that was 120 seats and then room service and then all sorts of things and I should have said no to that job but I said yes out of ego and um, a desire to want to express myself and have an opportunity to cook people my food and you know. Where was that? Uh, the that suit. Yeah that was at the woods yeah so right. that was lots of chats with so you, you as well. So you mentioned um, ego. Yeah. So chefs have a, a known to have ego, apparently. Yeah. Um, 
But I, th there's a fine line. Yes, we need an, an everyone's got an ego, I guess. But yeah. it's important to control that ego, yeah. I guess, and, and understand. And be a realist as yeah. well. Yeah. So to talk about that, being a realist in, the, in this yeah. business. Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, to, to take that job and then realize that you, you can't. Like, I had a Bluetooth in my ear the whole day and I was getting spoken to by all these different kitchens and it was so overwhelming and uh, you know you, you just have to trust that people will cook your food well and all that sort of thing but it just got big like everything got big on me very quickly and I decided to move on from that role about 18 months in and I was really disappointed in myself because you don't want to be that guy that skips around town opening things and then moving on and being that person. So I was quite frustrated at, with myself at that time. And I kind of just sat at home for two weeks and I was really kind of down in the dumps and, you know, Julie kind of kicked, kicked me in the backside like she tends to do and, um, you know, just get on with it. Um, but, yeah, it's, it's a big hit to the ego. There's, there's a lot in it that... Um, I think Sydney's quite small as well, so when everybody everybody gets wind of you doing something, then they all back you to begin with, but then it's, I don't know, it's very difficult. Like, it's, it's hard to articulate, but I feel just be a realist with where you're up to with your own career and try to set aside your emotion behind and, and things. St and stick to your path. Do yeah, your own thing. black and white. Just don't get mixed up in yes. what other people say. And, and That's do. right. Um, so you, you've got the restaurant, you've got the book. And we've got the butchery. And you've got so, the butchery. Yeah. Um, well, is there anything else you need to do now? <laughs> and I've got three kids, so right. I think we're done on all fronts. Um, <laughs> so you're retiring at 30? Yeah, Great. I'm done. I'm going to do a marker. So 37, you'll see me hang it up. But um, no, I, we're very proud of what we've done. And uh, just coming back from being overseas for the last month, seeing uh, people's thoughts around my, my book, and, and it's been very um, flattering to see how well it's been received. But... Yeah, like find a great mentor. That's my, my advice. Find a great mentor. Even find many mentors and continue to talk with them and, and continue to um, keep the conversation alive because they will have experienced something very similar uh, along the way. And yeah, I feel very privileged to now sit with Luke for a second time for the Inspired series and hopefully impart a little bit of knowledge. But yeah, thank you, Luke, for what you're doing in Australia because it's very well, amazing. Well, thank you. Big round of applause for Josh. Thank you. Thank you for your, um, a small amount of insight we got out of you in the small time we've got. Um, is any questions from, oh, two or three questions anyone wants to ask? Everyone goes quiet when I, to a room and you can ask a great young chef a question. Um, what sort of stuff would you impart on young chefs of today? What, what mm. do you think are the need to know things that young chefs should know? Well, I think, yeah, David Chang touches on a really interesting thing on his podcast about going not just straight into culinary school and to think maybe to learn a few other skill sets prior to going into cooking, which I think is fascinating because it's, you know, there, there's a lot of truth in that. Like, you, you, as a chef now in 20, almost 2020, and owning this business that I have, I'm realizing now that I need to be a social worker and I need to be, you know, a business planner, a marketing manager, a brand expert, like, you know, social media expert. Like, there's so much um, that you need to learn, but I feel like I can only engage in that because I know my basics well. And I know that sounds cliche and boring, but like, if you fundamentally find yourself working with somebody like try to really listen <laughs> and keep using your notebooks as opposed to a phone. Like um, there's amazing transfer of knowledge that happens when you put pen to paper as opposed to text, like putting, you know, words into a keypad. So, I mean, I still look back on all my notebooks and it's a really important tool to have. So uh, be patient with yourself. And like this sounds silly as well. Don't take drugs. Like, and I mean, that's funny, but like don't, engage in that nonsense because it clouds your like I can't even speak from experience because I've never put a cigarette in my mouth but it's you know from what I've seen over the years you engage in that part of a lifestyle and you drink and do sorts of things like you you'll, get mixed up. you'll get mixed up and not only it'll cloud your ability to make decisions whilst cooking you'll probably end up hurting yourself at some stage um, you'll probably be late to a shift you'll become the person that is uh, not helpful 
to to everyone in your kitchen. So be but be patient with yourself and, and incrementally step your way through different stages and don't race. It's a marathon. So yeah, and I've only learned that in the last five years. So very yeah. good. Well there you go. Big round of applause. Thanks. Thank you, Josh. <laughs>